The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, being through chemistry. of American men and women who have labored and today labor still with hand and mind and heart to build and to preserve a great free nation. The Cavalcade of America proudly dedicates the unending story of a new way of life in a new world. The Cavalcade of America presents the story of the greatest triumph in American diplomacy. Our radio play, Dr. Franklin Goes to Court, has been especially written for this series by Eric Barno. Starring in the role of Benjamin Franklin is John McIntyre of the Cavalcade Players. The part of John Adams is played by Ray Collins. Vergen by Carl Swenson. Benny by Sarah Fussell. King Louis XVI by George Caloris. The Wig Dresser by Elliot Reed. And Silas Dean by Kenneth Delmar. Our orchestra and original musical score are under the direction of Don Voorhees. DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents Dr. Franklin Goes to Court as our drama on the Cavalcade of America. September night in the year 1776, at a small inn in New Brunswick, New Jersey, two gentlemen, by the light of a lamp, follow the innkeeper to an upstairs room. One is John Adams, the other Benjamin Franklin. This is the room, gentlemen. Oh, but this will never do. This uh, one bed. Uh, show us something else, please. I just told you it's the only room we have. But heavens, man. Adams, if we two corpulent fellows are to sleep in that one bed, I fear we must pack ourselves rather closely. Oh, it's out of the question. Innkeeper, you must show us another room. Well, I've told you we're full. All day the roads have been crowded with men going to join Washington's army. Indeed. Is that so? Yes, I don't know what it's all about. There's trouble blue brewing in this land, I know that. One man showed me some handbill he had from Philadelphia. Some declaration or other. Declaration of independence? I don't know. All I know is they keep coming through here, and you gentlemen are lucky I can even give you this one bed. Well, Adams, the next inn is too far away for my gouty bones. I fear we must make the best of it. Dreadful. Thank you, innkeeper. We'll take a room. Sleep well, gentlemen. Room's hardly large enough to hold the bed. Uh, 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 the bed creaks like my bone. A place to hang one's clothes. Adams, it may ease you to reflect that here are the lowly beginnings of American diplomacy. A few weeks ago, these states proclaimed themselves before all the world free and independent. And here is one of their first diplomatic missions. Two bulky gentlemen in one inadequate bed on their way to a hopeless peace conference with an English commander. Well, not hopeless, Doctor. Well, almost hopeless. Washington's army is desperately situated. He can never hold New York. All the cards are in English hands. What can we expect from a peace conference with Lord Howe. I fear before we're through, we'll have to seek help elsewhere. The whole thing makes this bedroom so exasperating. I did want a good night's sleep so that my head would be clear tomorrow. Your head will be clear, all right. We'll just open this window. Oh, uh, Dr. Franklin, please, uh, shut the window. What's the matter? Uh, the night air, I can't endure it. Please, I'm susceptible to cold. Oh, nonsense. Come on to bed. Air will do us good. But I'll catch cold. No, you won't. 
Obviously, Adams, you're not familiar with my theory on coals. Now, if you followed my writings, you'd know about it. Now, get into bed, and I'll explain it to you. Then leave that window alone. Well, all right, but it seems risky. Oh. Yeah, I'm so tired, this bed feels good. Oh. Now, my theory on coals, Adams, is simply this. Hey. Yes. You. No, my theory is that cold air has no connection with the coals. Air is good for you, even if it's night air. And cold comes from... comes from... Uh, Now then, uh, gentlemen, uh, may we come to the business of this conference? Indeed, yes. By all means, my lord. This is a crucial hour. Gentlemen, your rebel army is outnumbered and in grave peril. You, Dr. Franklin, with your brilliant logical mind, will understand the danger that faces it. Indeed, my lord. Yet I rejoice that at this hour His Majesty's government offers a generous peace. We shall be happy to hear it. The offer is that if the colonies will immediately cease their insurrection, the Crown will pardon the rebellion and joyfully forgive its subjects. Lord Howe, you've burned our towns. You've brought foreign mercenaries to massacre peaceful citizens. And now you propose to forgive us. You express yourself ardently, Dr. Franklin. My Lord, clearly you do not yet know the free people with whom you deal. If the terms are not accepted, the war must go on. It would grieve me deeply to see these colonies go down in war. We will do our utmost to spare you that grief. Uh, am I late for the meeting? I'm just beginning. Dr. Franklin, I waited here for you. The Congress has made an important decision. Yes? You and other envoys are to go at once to Paris. Well, with my 70 years' accumulation of gout... Only you could make this mission succeed. What is the mission? To make an alliance with France. We all know the secret supplies she's sending are not enough. We must make an open alliance. Uh, do you know what you're proposing? Well, how do you mean? I'm to visit a land of royalty. Of dukes and powdered wigs and medieval trappings. And I'm to say to them, we're having a revolution. We want to overthrow everything you stand for. Won't you help us? Yes, I know, I know. That's why we ask you. Only you could do it. Mm. <laughs> well, my young grandsons and I might enjoy a trip to Paris. Yes, particularly Benny. I'll take them along. Uh, they say that French foreign minister, the Comte de Vergennes, they say he's a sly fox. So are you, Dr. Franklin. Gentlemen. Monsieur le Comte. How do you do, sir? Dr. Franklin, I am... Happy to meet the great man who tamed the lightning. Taming the lightning was easy compared to my present task. Dr. Franklin, you must realize that I cannot receive you as a diplomat. And I can only assume that you did not receive my letter at the boat. Then I hope, Monsieur Le Comte, you will forgive me for leaving you with that assumption. Mm. I tried to convey a suggestion that your landing in France would be unwise, that it might create embarrassment. I do not feel embarrassed, Monsieur Le Comte. You do not seem to be. Uh, you see, Dr. Franklin, in the eyes of our English friends, France cannot be befriend agents of rebels. 
The English ambassador made that quite clear to me. He did, eh? Yeah, quite clear. And my letter explained it thoroughly. Uh, you see, Monsieur le Comte, I came here hoping to discuss an alliance of France and America uh, against England. Well, if uh, America should defeat England and thus make France the most powerful nation in Europe, naturally, we would not mind. And we shall continue to help you secretly with money and supplies. But an alliance, impossible. Uh, uh, could we obtain an audience with His Majesty to discuss this matter? There can be no point to it. His Majesty is wisely influenced by our leaders of thought. I see you agree with our old adage. A word to the wise is sufficient. It is a very clever saying, Dr. Franklin. But I cannot advise you, and I cannot receive you again. Our friends, the English, watch us closely. And so goodbye, monsieur. Good day, monsieur de Comte. Good day, sir. That was quickly settled. Yeah. Dean. Yes? He spoke of the leaders of thought, didn't he? Yes. Have you ever been to a salon, Dean? I don't even know what they are. Uh, very important institutions in French life, salons. You know, we're going to meet beautiful ladies. Uh, but we have work to do. And we're going to do important business. Very interesting things, salons. <laughs> Sorry, Dr. Franklin, but I must say good night now. Good night, my boy. And before I go, Dr. Franklin, I should like to tell you that at the first news of your great struggle in America, my heart was enrolled in it. Marquis de Lafayette, I shall always remember that. And I shall always be grateful to you for bringing me to this salon. Oh, not at all, Dr. Franklin. And when you see your father-in-law, pray convey my respects and my... Appreciation for his introducing me to so many excellent Frenchmen here in Paris. He's done me a great service. Good night, my boy. Good night. Good night, monsieur. Dr. Franklin. Oh, Dr. Franklin, you are deserting us. Uh, fair ladies, you give me no hope. I do give you hope, monsieur. Uh, but no certain hope. And I can only say the merry chase you ladies are leading me is responsible for my pitiful condition. What pitiful condition, for monsieur? <laughs> Why? My gout. <laughs> How can we ladies be the cause of your gout, monsieur? And when I was a young man, the fair sex showed me many more favors than they do today. And then I had no gout. I can only conclude that the love of fair ladies wards off the gout. When the ladies desert us, gout takes possession. <laughs> yeah, but now I perceive my fellow countryman, Mr. Dean, is looking at me most disapprovingly. I fear it's time to go home. Oh, mais non, monsieur. I fear I must. Good night, lady. Good night. Well, Dean? Dr. Franklin, such appalling frivolity, making eyes at perfumed ladies. Dr. Franklin, we have work to do. And we're doing it. Clearly, you don't yet understand the role of the salon. But from these salons, opinion radiates. There are only a few hundred men in France whose opinions matter. And we're going to reach those men, Dean. I met some publishers tonight. And soon our cause will be in print. We're going to write pamphlets and we're going to salons tomorrow night and the next and the next. We'll create opinion for America. <laughs> Ambassador from England. Your lordship, I am charmed to see you. Count de Vigeam, I come to register a firm protest against the activities of one Dr. Franklin, the toleration of whose insidious practices by this court cannot be considered neutral on your part. To what can you refer? A network of intrigue is set up to create a sentimental attachment to the virtues of rebel America. Have you seen his newest pamphlet? Uh, no. I will leave it with you. Furthermore, Arms are smuggled to America from French ports, purchased on I know not what security, 
for I can assure you the rebels have no funds. For your government to countenance all this endangers our good relations. Monsieur l'ambassadeur, steps will be taken. I would not for the world endanger the friendship between our nations. Uh, by the way, I hear that Lord Howe has captured Philadelphia. Congratulations, monsieur. So there we are. No more shipments of arms, no more pamphlets. By order of the Count de Vergennes. How can we now continue our work? Do you suppose it's true Lord Howe has captured Philadelphia? I fear it is. I wonder what's happened to General Washington. I don't know. But till the tide turns, we're doomed to a sort of backdoor diplomacy. Uh, we're not to be received and we're watched by spies. Undoubtedly. We're probably surrounded by them, English and French. If you ask me, we should employ still more spies. Let's play this game the way they play it. No, 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 just a moment. These gentlemen here have been playing that game for hundreds of years. I'm afraid our skill would be wanting. Uh, we do better to pursue a policy of honest innocence. Against unprincipled foxes? Roguery can often be best confounded by simple honesty. Listen. If we can be sure that all messages we send become known somehow to both the English and the French, perhaps this can be very useful to us. In what way? I have many friends in England. Suppose I wrote one of them a letter. It wouldn't matter much if it never reached him, provided it reached King Louis. Ah. What would you say in this letter? Well, something like this. Dear so-and-so, my envoys and I have carefully considered your proposal that England and America come to terms at once and that America should, in return for her independence, aid England in taking the French West Indies from France. The proposal seems to us at the moment not quite honorable even though I may say some Americans would favor such a development. What an idea, Dr. Franklin. I think when King Louis' spies take in this letter, it will make the hair of his wig stand on end. Your Majesty. Uh, yes, Vergen. Uh, you recall we discussed an alliance between France and America suggested by Dr. Franklin? Ah, Dr. Franklin, Dr. Franklin. Why must everyone keep talking of Dr. Franklin and his clever epigrams and brilliant pamphlets? All I hear is Franklin and America. I wish to remind you of that alliance. Well, then we don't want that alliance. Why should we ally ourselves with some rebels that are being chased all over America? Ah, but the course of battle has changed. An entire English army under Burgoyne has surrendered at Saratoga. Really? Really? Yes, I'm glad to hear it. I'd like to see the English get beaten. Of course, I'd like to see the rebels get beaten, too. Well, uh, after all, they're fighting against the king. Vergen, I'd like to see both sides lose this war. It begins to look as though France might lose this war. France? How is that possible? England, alarmed at the cost of the war is offering America terms of peace. Well, how does this affect us? America, in return for her independence, is asked to help England steal Your Majesty's West Indies. My West Indies? But that's terrible. What can we do? There's only one course open. Ah, oh, those villains. But then, I, I'm furious about this. My West Indies. An outrage, Your Majesty. It's treachery, treachery. Well, should we enter the war? Should we join America? Ah, but they, they, they are rebels. Virginia, what do our leaders of thought think uh, of America? America is on every tongue. It's become to them an exciting legend. Really? Ah, that frightens me, Virgin. I suppose I, I must decide. Ah, oh, Virgin, if I only knew what to do. Sire, I think the time has come for you to extend a court invitation to Dr. Franklin. <laughs> Dr. 
Mr. Franklin, I have good news for you. Indeed. His Majesty has at length decided after these weeks of deliberation that he cannot refuse all possible aid to a people struggling for liberty. A noble decision. And he will avow the alliance by receiving you and your fellow envoys at court. Then at last America enters the world of diplomacy by the front door. <laughs> My young grandsons will be excited about this. But you know, of course, Doctor, that uh, the court reception means formal court attire. You mean I must wear a wig? Yes, Monsieur. Court regulations. Uh, what a cruel blow. Just when everything was going so nicely. <laughs> It's your grandson, Dr. Frank. Oh, Benny, Benny, come in, my boy, come in. How are you getting along, Grandpa? Are you almost ready? Well, you'd better ask His Excellency the wig dresser. It seems to me we're getting nowhere. We've had such tugging and pulling and... No! Oh. Is he almost ready, sir? Uh, young man, if you could persuade your grandfather to sit still, we should be ready in a very short time. But how can I get this wig arranged if he constantly squirms? Monsieur, you have been belaboring that wig for almost an hour. Hours. I cannot help it, Monsieur Doctor. It will not arrange itself correctly. Well, let me see. Oh, my. It doesn't look at all like Mr. Dean's. It doesn't, eh? Yeah? Oh, he's downstairs parading around the garden. Oh, he looks beautiful, just like a duke. I cannot understand it. Your head is a strange shape, Doctor. Mm -hmm. It's not my head. It's the wig is too small. It is not too small. Mon Dieu, it is the biggest wig in France. It is the head that is too large. Well, what are you going to do? Mr. Dean says it's almost time to go. Monsieur, if you will sit still, I shall attempt once more. I am certainly not going to sit still. I have sat here long enough being tortured. And why? To fit over my head a monstrosity. A symbol of all the foolishness, the vanity, the inequality that pass here for civilization. Benny, look at that thing. A piece of canvas with six pounds of hair sewed on it. Put it on a man's head and you have an aristocrat. Yeah, throw it away. I suppose I'll have to go this way. How does it look? Why, Grandpa, you look much better that way. Monsieur, permit me to say... I have dressed the hair of noblemen for many years. But you, that way, with your white hair flowing back over your shoulders, you look more noble than any. A nobleman of nature. Really? Well, well. It looks fine. <laughs> you know, if I go this way, Benny, I might even steal the show. I'll be the only man there in his own hair. Yes, go like that. This way you're more beautiful than Mr. Dean. Right, Benny, right. Why should I go like an imitation duke, a relic of medieval horrors? I go as an envoy from a new land, a land of free people, of men and women. I'm going as an American. <laughs> Thus was secured the greatest triumph of American diplomacy. The French alliance of 1778 foreshadowed the victory that won American freedom at Yorktown. And to the genius of the patriot who welded it belongs the tribute of the America that has arisen today. Benjamin Franklin, one of the mighty in the cavalcade of America. Cavalcade of America thanks John McIntyre and the Cavalcade players for their performance of Dr. Franklin Goes to Court. And now the DuPont Company brings you its story from the wonder world of chemistry. This is the story of a plant at Deepwater, New Jersey on the Delaware River. A plant that never stopped growing. The cornerstone of the first little red brick building was laid 23 years ago in 1917. 
New buildings are still going up today. The place has grown so vast that names must be given its streets to keep visitors from getting lost. Construction has never stopped. For the first chapter of Deepwater's story, we go back to 1917. In 1917, the United States, utterly dependent on foreign manufacturers, found its stock of dye stuff so low that even the United States Post Office had to skimp on its colors in printing postage stamps. The DuPont dye plant at Deepwater was started then and is partly responsible for the fact that today, 95% of all the dyes we need are made in America. Then came automobile tires. In the early 20s, tires were expensive. One that ran 10,000 miles was something to brag about. Tire manufacturers were looking for ingredients that would give tires longer life. Chemists at Deepwater found them, and the plant grew. A little later, the automobile industry itself was faced with a problem. Could anything be added to the gasoline, engineers asked, that would make high compression motors practical? The answer was found by the Ethyl Gasoline Corporation in tetraethyl lead, and more red brick buildings for its manufacture went up in the green park along the river's edge at deep water. After tetraethyl lead came man-made rubber. Half the nations of the world were searching for it. Deep water found it in neoprene. Then came electric refrigerators. The manufacture of Freon, the safe refrigerant, began at deep water, and still other buildings went up along the river's edge. A few more years passed, and with them came a new method developed by the petroleum industry to make better gasoline. However, this new gasoline reacted more readily with air to oxidize and form gummy compounds which fouled the valves and other parts of automobile engines. Chemists at Deepwater solved the problem by creating an antioxidant to prevent such deterioration and preserve the initial high fuel value of the better gasoline. And Deepwater grew further. So Deepwater, which employed 2,000 workers in 1925, today employs 5,700. One building has become 700 buildings. The 14 million pounds of product of 1920 have become the 168 million pounds of 1940. This is the story of Deepwater, a plant that has never stopped growing because America has never stopped growing a plant that is a living embodiment of the words of the DuPont Pledge, better things for better living through chemistry. Ladies and gentlemen, on the night of January 5th, 1936, a company of radio players, including most of us here tonight, were broadcasting the 18th program in Cavalcade of America. In that cast was a young girl. To us, she was another very talented child actress. Today, Millions of moviegoers know her as Nancy Kelly. Next week, she returns to the Cavalcade of America, and we are proud to announce that she will be our star in a radio version of the Broadway Hollywood success, The Farmer Takes a Wife, by Frank B. Elser and Mark Connolly. It is a colorful drama of life on the old Erie Canal, one of the great milestones on America's march to the West. And on that occasion, the Cavalcade players are going to be very happy to have Nancy back with us again. Thank you. On the Cavalcade of America, your narrator, William Spargrove. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from DuPont. This is the National Broadcasting Company.